Great. <laughs> there it is. Great, thank you, and uh, well done for remembering to all you describe yourself. I'm Paul, I'm a 30 year old, white, um, bold individual with a, a dark black beard and a kitchen in the background with the door open in the left hand top. From your side, left, left, right, right, right side of the screen. Um, although it is left to me. Uh, I am co-director of Shoot Festival, and we have, uh, alongside F13, which is the artist network here in Coventry, set up this 10-week programme of access training, specifically aimed at independent artists, creatives, producers, project managers, trying to make their work a little bit more accessible um, through 2021 here in Coventry, but also much further beyond that. We hope this is the start of a journey and Philippa, who was in the room, is going to be leading a session next week that tries to piece together some of the learning over the past nine weeks, including this one, um, to try and make a, a sort of manifesto for access for creatives um, to be using as they go forward. Um, so that will be sort of the culmination of all of this lovely research and learning that we've been going through. I'm delighted today to be joined by Ros Chalmers and Charles Block. Um, who are going to lead today's session, which is focusing on blind and partially sighted audiences. I did a workshop with Roz a year and a bit ago uh, over Zoom uh, in one of the very first lockdowns, and it was absolutely amazing. Um, I learned so much about audio description and how to use that and, and what was important and how to process that. And so when this came up, I immediately went to Roz as somebody that I thought would be perfect to to impart some wisdom on us from her many years of experience. <laughs> and, and then we'll be joined by Charles, who uh, works at Belgrade Theatre on the box office uh, and is a bit of their access guru, becoming uh, the champion, is it, of, of access in the Belgrade. So uh, delighted to have him here too. I'm going to pass straight over to Roz um, and leave you to take it away. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Uh, my name is Roz Chalmers. I'm a woman in my 60s, white, white hair, pink glasses, and my pronouns are she, her. I've um, been an audio describer for quite a long time. And as Paul said, at the beginning of the lockdown, I started to think about what we could do for very small theatre companies and individual performers to think about how they could make their work more accessible. So I ran a series of workshops and uh, I met some fantastic people in the smaller theatres uh, who were very, very eager to start making things more accessible and including audio description in the work that they were doing. So I've, I work um, as an audio describer and I also work as an audio description trainer. I've been uh, describing for Oh, about 22, 23 years um, in very many different places. I work on ballet, I work on opera, I work on contemporary dance, um, opera, drama, musical theatre, I work in museums and galleries. All of those places welcome audio description to a certain degree. There are some places that we're still hitting at the, at the closed doors, unfortunately, but anywhere really um, you will be able to find audio description. I've just been working on a film uh, series for the Horizons Festival and for Edinburgh International Festival where uh, people from all over the world are offering films and asking them for them to be audio described. This has been one of the great things about the lockdown is that suddenly the boundaries have gone and I've been talking to people from all over the world. I've been training people in South Korea, I've been training people in Hong Kong and India all of those people want to know about audio description. So the time is now, really. The time is now, we need to grasp it while people are still interested in the medium. Um, as an audio describer, I have probably been um, one of the more, uh, I've been, I was trained in traditional description. Traditional description is, uh, description 101 is stay out of the way of the actors don't describe over the dialogue, don't speak when somebody else is speaking. 
And as I've gone on and as I've worked with many different people, I've realized that there are rules that can be broken and there are ways of making things accessible that um, traditional audio describers perhaps won't have thought about. And I think I, sometimes this traditional description is thought of as bold on description and there's a reason for that. That kind of description normally happens after the show has been put together. Audio describers are not in the room with the creative when, when it begins. They don't have any input into the work that's being done. And as a result, what they have is a finished product. Now that, to some extent, that's good because that's what audiences are going to be witnessing. They're going to have the, the finished product. But unless you can get some good links with the creatives, there's a very great danger that you won't understand the production, um, particularly if, uh, sorry, there's, a, there's a, something coming in from Phil Cross. Next week's manifesto session will actually be led by an aut autistic artist and activist. Just say, um, and Talking Birds board member Dan Thompson and Katie Walters from Radical Body, a Coventry Disability Arts Organisation producing radical new works of performance by and for disabled people. Thank you, Phil, for that. I'd like to talk, you, talk to you about that later as well. Back to the audio description. With audio description, um, we, we really think in terms of um, creating after the piece has been developed. And it's, it's becoming more and more likely now that particularly with disability-led theatre, that the audio description will be created at a different time. It'll be created in the room with the creatives. I'll talk about, uh, about that a little bit more later because that has its pros and cons as well. Uh, it certainly can be very helpful, um, but sometimes we, we find that the access gets a little bit lost in the mix. And if you don't have visually impaired people involved, if you don't pay visually impaired people to be involved, then what you get is a sighted person's perspective. As a describer also, I know that I come from a very certain perspective. As I said, I'm white. I'm in my 60s, um, I am cishet, so I have a very different kind of um, experience to bring to the work. So I'm really pleased that now other groups are getting in, other people are getting in, other individuals, and particularly the blind and partially sighted people are leading the way on this. Audio description started about 30 years ago in, in the UK, no, 50 years ago, let's be honest, about 50 years ago now. I'm older than I think, 50 years ago in the UK. And it was definitely led by visually impaired people. They wanted to go to the theatre um, with their sighted friends, companions, families. And they started putting together some rules and a manifesto for audio description. So the work that we do and the work that we have been doing has been led by the audience. Um, as things have changed, as people have wanted more, as um, theatre has developed more into non-traditional styles, we've had to grow with it and we've had to constantly be talking to our audiences about what works best for them. And as a result, you can find very many different types of audio description around the place. So I'm going to talk today about the three types of description. I'm talking about traditional description, I'm talking about integrated description, and I'm going to talk about creative description, those three particular elements. Um, this is something that um, I've really taken from Amelia Cavallo, who has done quite a lot of work with Quiplash, and she has kind of defined those, those particular pieces of description. And I can't really work any better than that. I can't work better than that. She's a blind woman herself. Um, she's an artist herself. And uh, she is a very, I mean, she's a, a wonderful um, person to talk to about audio description. I don't want to leave Charles out of this because I think before we get into any more audio description, um, I'd like Charles to just give, him, give you an idea of his work and um, perhaps talk to a little bit about, from a blind person's perspective, the kind of things that 
he wishes sighted people knew, perhaps. Charles, can I go over to you? Hi, uh, thanks, Roz. Um, Charles, oh, sorry, Charles, could we just do a quick switch of the BSL interpreters, if that's okay? Absolutely. Thanks. Good. Okay, great stuff. So yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, so um, I'm again, I'm Charles, a bit about me. Uh, I'm uh, a 27 year old male, white male. Uh, I've got black hair and I'm currently wearing a black shirt. Um, and I'm sure everyone will be most loving to know that my guide dog is in the back of the camera in the corner and you can see him hopefully he won't be interacting too much and snoring too much um he's he loves a good um you know good snooze during the day so hopefully he won't be doing uh, too much of that <laughs> whilst i'm talking and interrupting us um so yeah I, i'm uh, registered blind uh, and severely sight impaired uh, i have about 10 percent vision remaining and i've had that since birth so I would almost say that that's something for me is, sec you know, my sight loss is second nature to me now that I act like I haven't got a disability almost and I carry on with my day and I overcome the barriers in a, in a very seamless way almost. Um, a bit about my eye conditions, I'm very light sensitive. Uh, my eyes move uncontrollably. Uh, I have cataracts and glaucoma, which both go together with making the eyes more blurry and lots of pressure, meaning I have to have lots of eye drops um, to keep my eyesight the same. Um, so I, I'd, I'd say that I've got quite a good little bit of, of a party going on inside my eyes um, and all of their eye conditions affect me in different ways at different times of the day. For example, I'm a very much a night owl. I love the evenings and I can work the best during the evenings and into the early hours almost. Um, so when I'm working in, during the day, my eyes can get very tired. And the longer I use, say, technology with computers and phones and such, um, my eyes do get very tired. So, for example, as it's Friday today, um, I've been using a computer consistently all week and now my eyes, are, I'm feeling the drain. So Fridays is usually a bit more of a, um, I say, a, a slower day for me because I feel like I have to find other adaptions to allow me to carry on with my productivity. Uh, for example, using a screen reader on my computer or magnifiers and um I suppose what, what we're all here to do is talk about is audio description. So I use audio description um, at various times when I feel like it's something that I'd really benefit from. I am thankfully one of the people that sits almost on the fence with, I don't use it all the time and sometimes don't think it's for me. And then sometimes I think, you know, gosh, I can't, you know, this is all that I, uh, Oh, it's the only way I'm going to be able to access this piece of content and enjoy it. Um, I have ha oh, I have lots of friends who are both visually impaired and blind because I went to a school and a college that was focused for just disabled children. Um, so I've got a really good community of friends who have similar eye conditions and similar impairments, but also we don't we're not all the same. You know, we have our own opinions on, say, audio description and how the way how we access things. So some people I know who are completely blind um, would never use audio description. They think, no, it's not for me. I, I, I will just struggle on and not use it. And, I, and that sometimes I think, wow, that's that that's almost baffles me because you think you must be missing so much. And then some people who have better sight than me, who use say audio description all the time. Um, some of the very basic things, and I'm sure like Roz will definitely cover this in a moment. It's the little things that with audio description that we feel that we miss being in the visually impaired and blind community, such as, you know, facial expressions, body language. They paint such a massive picture of the story sometimes that can be so easily missed if you're not concentrating. And them little bits of description can really pull the whole sort of enjoyment of the experience together. Um, 
and if you know if you if you don't uh, if you're not able to enjoy that experience without having say audio description available to you you feel like you've you have to rely on other people to maybe ask them what was you know what was happening then or you know can you describe something little to me i didn't understand that and it that sort of takes that away from that being independent almost as a disabled person i love being an, an independent disabled person so having to rely on someone else to help me do something that you know should be quite enjoyable such as going to the theater or watching a film you know audio description is there to just over one of them you know devices to overcome that barrier um I don't, I, don't, I don't want to start rambling on, so I'll, I'll hand back over to Roz because she's got some wealth of knowledge that you guys will definitely benefit from. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. I'll be back with you, don't worry. We want to find out about the sort of work that you're doing in the Belgrade and yes. how you're attracting new audiences. I think that's, that's something that people will want to do. It's all very well offering the thing, but how do you actually get people into the room with you? Absolutely. So, um, audio description. Um, it's in its basic form. It is describing the parts of a production or an artwork or whatever, something that the artist has chosen to render in a visual format rather than an audible format. So in a theatre, it might be a fight scene. It could be a love scene. It could be um, a dance piece. It could be um, just somebody wa walking around a room hiding weapons that will become uh, important later. And if those are not visible to our audience, then they risk missing a great deal of the plot. As an audio describer, I will go into the show and I will watch it at least once. And then I will write introductory notes. I will write notes to, to myself as I watch it to remind me what the sets look like, what the characters look like, and what the costumes look like, and any significant props. And um, at this point, somebody will usually ask me, um, is it worth offering color, descriptions of color, to somebody who can't see? And I'm, I'm gonna come back to you, Charles, because I'd like to, to get your take on this. Um, yeah, it's definitely a, a big question. I, I especially a, a lot of completely blind people that they, they you should be surprised how often they get asked that question. Um, they do find it still very useful because at the same time, from my experience as well, colour can be associated with emotion, with um, a memory or something like that. So it's almost a colour is still just as important, I would say. I think most people have told me that. Um, there are some people, we're talking probably of a small percentage, probably about 3% of people who can see nothing at all, and a smaller percentage of that who have never seen anything at all. And yet they're living in a sighted world and there is a cultural significance to color. So if I asked you, um, I don't mean you, Charles, I mean the greater, the wider world, um, if I asked you, um, what do you think of the significance of red? What do you think somebody would use red to signify? Please come at me. Passion. Passion. Anything um, else? Thank you. Danger. Danger. So, so we've got some good things. We've got passion. Passion is good. I think we can all agree that passion is good. We've got danger. What else? Anything else that it might do? How? Ooh. Sorry? I was going to say how. As how? How. Oh, hell. Hell. Sorry. Excellent. Hell. I was thinking, I'm sorry. I was thinking about, I suddenly got into Space Odyssey there. Um, okay. So hell, yes. Fire and flame and heat. I was going to say warmth. Yeah. Warmth. Again, a positive thing, quite a positive thing. So you've all got slightly different ideas of um, red. Have you got any, any different ideas of green? Oh, Coley has said in the chat, a sign to stop movements on red. Just a sign like. to stop movements, yes, something to stop, yeah. And I guess green is a go. <laughs> yeah, green is a go. What else is green? Calming. Calming. New life. New life, okay. 
Nature. Nature. Anything negative? Gentilism. Jealousy. Is jealousy. What was that one? Jealousy. Jealousy. Yeah, it's quite a negative one, isn't it? Mm. Sickness. Sickness. Nice one. Yes, that's what we want. Somebody throwing up. Yes. Um, somebody feeling sick. They can. They can. People say that they they go green. Um, you can be green with envy, but you can green, be green with sickness. Would you eat a green raspberry? Probably not, because green can also mean sour. It can mean so many different things. The colours mean so many different things. And we learn those as we go along, as we get go through our life. Um, I, for my sins, I used to describe wicked. Does anybody not know wicked? No, I think most, most people know wicked. You would know that Elphaba is a green witch. We um, often had lots of young people in the audience for that. Jealousy, Collier says, um, fire for some, positive, warmth for others, danger, indeed. Um, so yes, we, um, we with, with Wicked, we had a lot of young children in the auditorium. And for a lot of them, uh, we did workshops beforehand to explain why Elphaba was green. And for a lot of them, that, that was their first introduction. We're talking about eight to 11 year olds their first introduction of the, the um, cultural significance of colour. So they got an idea that not that green was bad, but green was other. She is thought of as other because she has a green skin. And that's the beginning of cultural significance of colour. And we go on and we go through. And designers use this. Designers use the idea of colour. Um, a show of Dracula, everything was in black, white, gray, in every scene there was a single red thing. It could be a rose, it could be a drop of blood, it could be a single pane of stained glass in a window. There was just some red just to bring this forward. And it wasn't a positive red, it was definitely red for danger. These things are very important when it comes to the theater because people, designers make choices. It's about designers, designers make choices. And as a describer, it's my, my job to get that over to it. But it's also useful in people's daily lives. People use colour in their daily lives. Um, if you are being given directions and you know that you have to pass a green wall, even if you can't see it, you can ask somebody if you pass the green wall yet. So it gives you some kind of um, I, um, some information that you can use to signpost along the way. So colour is something that we use very much so. I, I'm, I sort of stress this because this is something that always, always comes up. There's always a sense that you don't have to describe some things because A, people will know about them, it'll be obvious. B, um, it, it's something that they can't see, therefore they have no knowledge of. Most people have seen something at some time of their life. Most people have some kind of, of sight and they will use their sight in very different ways as Charles has um, described. We know that our audiences have very, very many different experiences of life, of education, of culture, of um, sight loss. They, they may have very different experiences of sight loss that have changed over a period of time, or they may have a sight loss that has remained static. We have no way of knowing. If I've got 30 people in the audience, I cannot, unfortunately, tailor the audio description to any one particular person. So what I have to do is I have to look at the show and I have to see what is the show trying to tell me? What is it trying to get across? What are the important bits? Where are the gaps? Where are the gaps? It is something that you know right from the word go that if you go over somebody talking, the audience will hear nothing. They will just hear a garble. They won't hear me and they won't hear somebody else. So I've just got to be out of the way when somebody is speaking. Sound effects. I need to describe sound effects because not everybody will understand what a sound effect means. Sound effects in theater are effects. They're not the sound itself. So, Things are used in order to um, indicate um, a sound. So um, a, an example I often give is 
uh, his dark materials, there was a witch and she was being tortured and somebody was going to break her fingers. And we had the hand there and then we heard crack as the fingers were broken. And the fingers were broken by actually twisting a piece of bubble wrap. Now, for the audience who could see that, there was a, a, a sort of universal recoiling and a that kind of sound. If you are in the audience and you're hearing bubble wrap and everybody's reacting in a very strange way, then you are left out of that information. If you know that there is a witch there, that somebody has hold of her hand and they're about to crack her fingers and then you hear that sound, it suddenly becomes the effect. It suddenly becomes the sound itself. So you cannot assume that just because somebody can hear something that they can interpret it in any particular way. How many times have you said to yourself, what's that noise? And you really have no way of, of locating it. It's the same for anybody who's visually impaired. And we know that theater is full of sounds. Some of them, some of them are, are less important than others, but they're all sounds and they all add to the story. But some of them will need description. Somebody's beating a carpet. You don't know that the carpet's there until you hear boom, boom, boom. And then you wonder what the noise is. So that's also part of my role. How does the audience get hold of this information? How do they listen? Well, they listen usually through incredibly uncomfortable headsets. They're usually like stethoscopes and they hang off the ears. And they are not designed for somebody who has a visual impairment. Lisa? Right, I'm so sorry to interrupt. I think uh, I just saw that the BSL uh, video had gone off. So I think we're just doing Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay. Wait, we come back. Okay, ready. Okay. Thank you. Can I just make sure what, what was missed? If you wouldn't mind repeating about the headsets, Ros, that would be yes. great. Thank yes, you. thank you. Um, the, the headsets are often extremely uncomfortable. They are worn like, they're called stethosets, they're worn like a doctor's stethoscope, and they are in the ears. Now, if you put something in somebody's ears and they can't see as well, um, then you are shutting off a lot of the information that they're getting. They're not able to hear ambient sounds. They're not able to um, really engage with the audience around them. And they may not hear the sound from the stage so easily. So these headsets, they really have their disadvantages. And it's the one thing that people say is most difficult when listening to audio description, that is wearing the headsets and feeling cut off from everything else. So um, things haven't really changed in a long time. These headsets that are being used in most theatres um, are used with infrared systems. Infrared systems um, were originally brought in to enhance the sound for people who are hard of hearing. And it works very well. And then they realised, oh, we could do this for audio description as well. But these headsets are not very tactile. They're not very intuitive. They're uncomfortable and there are problems with them. Even the modern ones, if you sit with your, in your ears, they sit sort of slightly down on your chest. And if you've got um, an infrared system and anybody walks in front of you or somebody is sitting in front of you who's a bit taller or you have um, any kind of um, obstruction in your way, then you will hear, you will lose the signal and you will hear shh, shh, shh as people go by. So they're uncomfortable and they're difficult. Lately, people have started using radio to, <clears throat> to provide the service. And in that case, it's often quite clear. It's much more clear, but they are expensive and still not very many theatres are using them. Smaller theatres are, individual people are, but it still means that you've got to wear something. I'm about to do some work at the Kingston Theatre, Rose in Kingston, and we're going to try out some bone conduction listening devices. So they will be worn on the temples and leave the ears clear. The difficulty with those may be that the sound will bleed through to other members of the audience. 
and we know how very much other members of the audience don't like to be disturbed by disabled people. So it can be quite difficult, but we will try them out and we will feed back. I tried them out about four years ago and they were really quite poor at that time, but changes have been made. So hopefully uh, bone conduction hearing devices will become a little bit more popular in the future. You can have um, headsets that will clip onto your belt and you can wear your own headphones. That again is quite good, but we've all sat on a bus or on the tube and we've listened to somebody playing their music and they have it up quite loud and all we're getting is shh, 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 shh. And we describe only in the silences. So when it's silent and somebody is going through their big death scene, I'm talking to you, Martin, Sheen, Michael Sheen. Michael Sheen was doing his big death scene in, in Caligula and there was me describing away. 60 people in the audience, all with their headsets turned up full. He heard everything of that death scene, every single word of it. Bulletproof man carried on, probably put a few more wriggles and, and writhings in for my benefit. He, that was okay. The same thing happened in the Hampstead Theatre and it was a nude scene. And it was a very provocative nude scene. And the woman was stripping off. She was a Jewish um, prisoner. She was being, she's stripping off in front of a German guard and she was being provocative. The, the actor was totally naked by the end of it. And she heard her nude scene being described throughout. Uh, it wasn't me describing, thank God, um, but a very uncomfortable situation for, for the actor as well. So, we need to work on the tech because people will pay money to come to the theater. They will pay good money to come to the theater and they expect to understand the play. They expect to hear the audio description. They do not expect to have to fight through poor tech in order to get there. Right, I want to talk to you a little bit about, I want to show you a little bit of traditional audio description We go before we go any further. Forgive me, the vicissitudes of Zoom may mean that you're not going to get um, a very uh, crisp audio description, but I'm going to share my screen with you. And I'm going to get, I've, I've been struggling with quite a lot of this tech so far. So. Here we go. This is a little piece called Bedroom Farce. And uh, it's a two hander. Uh, Ernest and Delia sitting in bed. It's an Alan Akeborn, so you can't get very much closer to traditional description than this. I hope you can hear me. Ernest's in bed holding a plate of filchards on toast. Neely is at her dressing table, busy with hand cream. I think we're in imminent need of a hot water bottle here, you know. Oh, yes. Bearing in mind the normal running temperature of your feet. It's not my fault. Most women have cold feet. It's circulation. Well, I wouldn't know about that. I haven't sampled that many. All the girls at school had cold feet. Well, not the younger ones. The younger girls had very hot feet, like little boys. But when we got into the sixth form, we all found we had cold feet. She spreads her hands, bringing the matter to a close. <laughs> Something to do with maturing. Very curious. Chaps I shared a hut with in the army all had overwhelmingly hot feet. Oh, I can imagine. Yes. I pronounce these potions a success. Jolly good. Well, here I come. Stand by for cold feet. Dealer gives him a look and jumps into bed. He makes room for her. She picks up her own toast and pilchards and looks across at him. Oh, darling, you're getting fish. All over the sheets. Oh, <clears throat> now we're going to reek of fish all night. She grabs a wad of tissues. I don't think this was a 
terribly bright idea of somebody. He licks the tissues and scrubs vigorously in the region of Ernest's groin. He watches, blinking rapidly. Delia mops her nose with the tissues and drops them by the bed. She rearranges her toast meticulously on her plate. Ernest flexes his neck and examines his coaches. Oh well, <coughs> you only live once. <laughs> what the hell? Hmm? When it's on your side, you'll have to put up with it. They munch their toast. Delia considers the pilchards. Hmm. Yes, quite pleasant, aren't they? Not up to sardines, but not bad. They got my vote. <clears throat> this we're in for a reasonably early night. Yes. <laughs> Sunday tomorrow we can lie in. Go for a walk. Later on, that if you like. That would be nice. If I'm wet. Oh, rather. Otherwise, we'll both be crouching in the rafters with buckets. Oh, God forbid. They munch on. The light fades. Well, I'm hoping you heard the description on that. Did you? You managed to. So um, you'll find out by that that um, a describer doesn't describe what they want to do, they describe what they can. There were few gaps in that, and it was a question of making those decisions in order to get across partly what the audience was laughing at. Because the audience is laughing, and we want to know why that audience is laughing. So the fact that, um, uh, that she was rubbing at his groin and um, you, I mean, you could say an awful lot of things there, but I felt I really kind of needed to use the, the, let the audience use their imagination. Once you've got a woman's hands at a man's groin and she's scrubbing at them, there is likely to be some kind of result. Um, so it's really just a question of, of just going, just sort of leading them slightly in that direction and then leaving them to it, to, to enjoy it or not, as the case may be. We try not to be interpretive. We try not to say that you know, he's enjoying it. I don't know if he's enjoying it or not. Um, I don't know what their sex life has been up to that time. So, you know, I, I, I can't speak for him. I'm not in his mind. So I try not to interpret. So any comments about that, good or bad? I was interested that you did some description before we actually mm. saw because I guess that was because that's where you had time yes that's right in that case it was a setup um I mean, because you know it, this this is just a little snippet it was I think it was at the NT 50th anniversary and it was just a little snippet so I needed to sort of kindly quietly sort of set it up and um we are here there are two people um and he you know he's in bed and she's at the dressing, dressing, dressing table and I said that she's busy with hand cream because there wasn't really any more weight. I needed to get the fact that she was hand, putting her hands, creaming her hands. But because I, I said busy with hand cream to get an impression that she was really quite absorbed in the, in the task that she was doing, you know, that she was, you know, everything was getting creamed and rubbed and everything. And she was, you know, really invested in this hand cream. So um, uh, that's what I did beforehand. Um, that, in the, the later part of this, that we will have an opportunity to talk about again, um, because really, um, ideally, we would already know who these people were before we went into the theatre. Ideally, we would have an idea of the characters and, and how this, where this play was set before we actually go into the theatre. So you then are not going to be left wondering who these people are before you start. Any questions so far? Could you Lisa? Yeah, it's Lisa. Um, I just had a, a thought that I was suddenly really aware of the audience reactions during that, the applause and the laughing, and how actually, when listening to the audio description, how um, distracting that was. And it gave me a whole new kind of, it, it must be exhausting at times, concentrating throughout, well, I mean, I'm speculating there, but <laughs> having to concentrate on the audio description 
through other audience members making noise? Um, I think that's true. Um, um, I think we do very much underestimate how hard it is, the work that goes into listening to audio description against other things. We have um, the sound effects, we have music, we have the actors moving around the stage giving information, we have the people in by the side of us rustling their sweets and banging around the place. There are lots and lots of things that we'll describe. And we are fighting against that. We are asking the audience to concentrate on something in a very difficult space. Some people, I won't say they can't do it, but they would rather not do it. And they would rather, if they have a good level of remaining sight, they would rather not use audio description. It is really, it, you know, we're, there's a very, well, there's a small percentage, but there is a percentage of people who will not have audio description at the theatre for the reasons that you said, Lisa. They really don't want to do it um, because it's a, it's a huge effort. It's absolutely a huge effort. Um, and as an audio describer, um, in the words of, C, of, of Stephen Sondheim, you have to be able to defend every word. Every word that you say has to have a defense and a reason behind it. Because every time you do this, you are saying to that listener, don't listen to that, listen to me. So you better have something to say. And if you haven't got anything to say, just shut up. Because you don't have to fill every single gap. There are gaps that are there for dramatic purpose. And there are gaps where the actor just wanted something to do with his hands, so he folded his arms. Nobody cares, because tomorrow he might not. Um, so it's really things that push the, the uh, information along, push the story along. Um, okay, um, question from Collier. I'd yeah. be curious to know how you see your role as merely an interpreter or as a sort of co-creator. In an ideal world, I think we would be a co-creator and we would ask for accommodation for the audio description. We would actually be able to go to rehearsals and we'd be able to say to people, if you give me two seconds of business here, extra seconds of business here, I can get that description in and it will mean that the person will understand better. They will have a better idea of your work, what your work is trying to do. Um, I, I kind of am an interpreter. I suppose I kind of am an, an interpreter. I'm sitting there with a script in front of me and I am, I am um, looking at what's happening and I am uh, writing my descriptions about in, in, in it. But my description does not exist without the show. It doesn't, you know, often people will say, well, can you come and, can I come and sit in the box with you and listen to you describe? And I just, I just I'm just gonna be shouting random words. You know, I'm just going to be sort of, it'll be a sentence every now and again. It is so dreary because it doesn't exist outside that medium of the show. You know, my script um, there was, was sort of 10, 10 lines of words, 10 lines of, of, of um, description. And, uh, you know, if I read it out to you, it wouldn't give you any idea of what was happening. It's the actors, it's the writing, it's the sound, it's the audience, because the audience will also tell you what's happening. Another question is about cultural references tied to sounds. How much do you consider them in your audio description? In um, I, swap, please. Yeah, thank you. Great, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, can you that question again, Ros, please? Yes. Another question is about cultural references tied to sounds. How much do you consider them in your audio descriptions? Can we unpick that? Can you can you can you give us some examples of that, Kolya, perhaps?
I'm trying to think of a cultural reference for sound as well. It's hard thinking on the spot. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm, 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 I'm thinking that there must be a, a particular example. I mean, uh, sounds that can be, oh, right, can be, in, for instance, related to Indian rituals. Definitely, definitely then I would want to speak to the company. I would want to know what things meant. I've just worked with a, a dance company, a woman um, who is uh, Sita Patel, who uh, has done a sort of adaptation of Rite of Spring. And she is um, somebody who has taken a, a, a Western cultural form and she's adapted into uh, South Indian dance. And so there, there, there were a lots of um, different moves that are in Bharatanayam and they meant particular things. They, they meant references to deities, for example. They meant references to ritual. Uh, that's something that I can't do on my own. And I really would need help from a creative. And she was fantastic. I would need you know, to do, do prior research for Indian audiences and not for other and for other ones not familiar with the sounds. Yes, I would. I would have to do a lot of research. I would talk to Indian friends, but I, who, who were, perhaps were interested, who, who knew that kind of dance. But um, I would also talk to the creatives. And in this case, I had a very generous choreographer who was working with me and she was able to um, feed me information, which I was then able to incorporate into the audio description. If you're describing dance, um, you're, you're, describe, you're, you're, you're speaking for 40 minutes, you're writing 40 minutes worth of work. Uh, so, you know, it's, um, you better get it right because the audience that comes to it are very likely to know these forms um, and they, they, you can't afford to get it wrong. This really points up the fact that in all the um, audio description work, work, there is terrible lack of diversity. Terrible lack of diversity. Most traditional audio describers look like me. Um, and but even the younger ones are, that are coming up are gonna look like me in, you know, in a few years time. So we need a great, a great number more, great more diversity of, of describers. We need people who do know the cultures. We need people who can bring the knowledge of their culture to the cherry orchard. You know, we don't just want to have a diversity of describers who will only be able to be pigeonholed. We want them to be able to describe everything and bring knowledge of their, of their culture and their stories and introduce their um, audiences into this. Again, I worked with um, an Indian, South Indian dancer who was very keen to bring in older blind audiences um, who, whose first language was not English, um, but they work perhaps in, church, in, in, in village halls and uh, in mosques and in temples so that they go to the audience rather than the audience going to them. So you know, there, is, there is work being done out there, but it's really slow and uh, it really needs a kick, it really needs a kick. Um, I think we need to break and, and give the um, sign language interpreters a break and you a break for your eyes. Should we take, how much do you want to, how long do you want to take, Paul? Uh, we usually just take about five minutes. Five minutes is fine. Yep. Okay. Great. Thank so you. We'll Come back in about five. Lovely, thank you, see you soon. Cheers. Charles, since you're there, <laughs> I want you to kick off this half to talk about the work that you're doing at the Belgrade. Yes, yeah, certainly, yeah. Um, so I've been working at the Belgrade since last March when sadly we got told to close. Literally the day we got told to close was my first day. Um, so that was a whirlwind. Um, so um, I, a bit of a backstory about me as well is that um, many, many years ago, I actually wanted to be an actor myself. Um, and I did performing arts at college and did my BTEC level three course in performing arts. So I've done all the acting, singing and dancing on stage and all that. Uh, and really, you know, obviously really enjoyed that. And after that, I was contemplating, um, obviously being a blind person going into the world of acting and how easy that would be. Um, and as, as I'm sure everyone knows, everyone says, get a backup 
um, mm -hmm. career as an actor, always a good idea. Um, and that's where I fell in love with technology. And um, again, because I knew it was something that, that was accessible for my disability. Why didn't you tell me that before? <laughs> I keep it under my hat a bit. <laughs> um i don't tell many people but now i'm telling everyone <laughs> um so um and then sort of full circle i went uh, to university and studied digital marketing and social media become very analytical with numbers and computers and um since graduating i now work in both the marketing and the box office department at the belgrade um so for me it feels like i have gone completely full circle because i now get to do what i love inside the theater and obviously get to uh, appreciate the shows at exactly the same time <laughs> um and i think since starting i've been very conscious that you know people with a disability do struggle to access the arts and i that's what like paul said at the beginning uh, i've become sort of the uh, unnominated person to um, talk about access and especially at our box office department, we have a, uh, a scheme called the Access Register. I'm sure a lot of people in the commentary would know about it who are uh, who are disabled, um, where you can sign up and you um, share information about your disability and then we can make sure that your experience is a beneficial and um, simplistic and you, so you feel like you don't have to worry that your impairment's going to um, encroach on your experience at Belgrade. So um, I've sort of been heading that up in the last couple of months and helping the front of the house team be more prepared for disabled audiences coming in. Um, but at the same time, I've also noticed that um, we haven't got a wealth of access performances. And it also goes back to um, well, obviously the questions of why is that at the same time, um, a lot of people say that we don't have the audiences who need them shows, but at the same time, my, all, my, my go back <laughs> question is, well, have you told them that it's happening? Otherwise, they're not going to, you know, they're not going to seek them out. Otherwise, if you don't know, if they, they don't tell them. And obviously this is why the access register at the Belgrade is such a powerful thing is that we know our audiences who are disabled and we can then segment them into blind, um, deaf and uh, full and then relaxed performances um, and all sorts like that. So we're able to actually segment them audiences. And I plan in a couple of months when I've got more time on my hands, um, City of Culture has been a bit of a whirlwind so far, <laughs> um, that, um, we're going to be doing a bit more targeted um, marketing for them sort of audiences to make sure that they feel appreciated and welcomed at the Belgrade, really. Um, so I know, I know Roger was talking about the headsets, which I've obviously used audio description in theatre before. And I, I, I for the first uh, time, I wasn't the biggest fan because obviously the whole signal and the, the interference, I didn't know if I'd had it switched on properly and the whole confusion around that, which it's quite daunting at the first time using it, but the second time it was a bit better and I felt like, oh, actually I can enjoy this a bit more. Um, with my level of visual impairment, I actually do uh, use uh, a telescope. So I try and sit somewhere in the auditorium that I would be able to use my telescope and then be able to look um, and then pan around the stage but obviously again my eyes get tired after a lot of time viewing through the the one eye <laughs> around the stage um, so then that's when the audio description really does kick in really and it does really better that experience for me um, so but again with the headsets um, I've, I've spoken to a few vision impaired and blind people who have used audio description prior to today, today's session. And a lot of people have said to me, they turn up to venues and they go, well, I, um, I've i asked for an audio description headset and the front of house team don't know exactly where they are. They don't know if they're charged. Um, they don't know how to switch them on. <laughs> it's because it is such a, it's a, they're devices that obviously aren't used day to day. So they're not, that experienced in that um, and that's one of these things that again at the Belgrade I'm going to be trying to make sure is a we're we're hot on because at the end of the day we if we 
become more inclusive and able to have more access performances, we need to make sure that we're fully trained up and ready for that full experience for that person so that they don't have to worry about it when they turn up to the show. Um, yeah, so that's my sort of background at the Belgrade and what I'm doing. Um, and I think it's, I think a lot of, a lot of, especially at venues, um, I feel that it's always a bit of a learning curve because, and, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to say anywhere's perfect because who can be at the end of the day <laughs> no one's perfect um uh so I, I, I but thankfully the disabled community are just very thankful for having that a little adaption to allow you to uh, to allow them to have the better experience so if you're willing and got the determination to better their their experience then they will definitely show your loyalty um for example, I, I, I did my dissertation at university when I was doing uh, marketing around accessible websites for visually impaired and blind people. And I, there was a, 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 a astonishing statistic of like 72% of um, visually impaired and blind people will not use a retailer website if it's not accessible with a screen reader. And if there's say 2 million visually impaired and blind people in the UK, that's a lot of people. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it's it may not feel as an important adaption to say have audio description and performances or something like that, but you are really allowing that person and a whole community to just feel like they are, I don't like saying the word normal <laughs> for a little a little time in their day. Can you give us any advice about the marketing um, where you would market to? For, for your audience? Um, yeah, so um, I think, I suppose, making sure that you're, firstly, like I was saying, we're about websites, um, your website is accessible, um, making sure that it works with maybe with a screen reader um, and that it's simplistic enough that you say, if you were to try and say book tickets, that you, there's no hurdles along the booking process. Um, and then uh, the way for the actual marketing, uh, again, with segmenting your audience, trying to find that demographic. Um, and then also doing a bit of outreach, sort of audience development type style. Uh, so for example, I know in Coventry, uh, there's a few organizations, for example, there's the Coventry Resource Center for the Blind, which is based in Elsdon. Uh, they've got a wealth of um, community of visually impaired and blind people who use their um, use their sort of centre every single day. Uh, there's the Warwickshire Association of the, for the Blind. They cover what uh, Coventry as well, so they have a pool of people, and you can use both them sort of networks to try and share your um, sort of. Your, your access, say your access performances, but at the same time that even if you want to do an outreach to say, we want to better our experience, or I want to talk to some people who would be able to maybe help me in bettering this experience, would you be able to put me in touch with some, you know, people that wouldn't mind talking to me about that? Them organisations will definitely more than happy to help you do something like that, because at the end of the day, it's mutually beneficial for them and you. So, it's, I think it's a bit, yeah, a bit, a bit of give and take, but also feel free to do your research. If you, you know, um, there is, like I was saying, that the, I, I, I surprise myself sometimes because I know so many visually impaired and blind people. And I, it's weird when I see, a, say, another guide dog going or walking down the street and I don't know them and I go, who's that? I haven't met them before <laughs> because I, we, we know it, it's, it's a fu funny thing that all guide dog owners know each other one way or another. Um, so, and we're just, we are just a community of people. And with that as well, there's great um, sort of word of mouth. So if someone like myself has a really great experience somewhere, they will definitely then pass that information on to someone else, uh, especially around order description because of its um because it's not so widely available on every single performance at a theatre so if they know that somewhere is really accessible and has an access performance that they know is 
definitely beneficial to go and watch and, and enjoy, then I'm no doubt that 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 <laughs> that, uh, that news will be shared. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. There's some things going on in the chat, which I'm sure that Paul will share with you about um, some kind of marketing. Um, yeah, the, the uh, Rose, really... Rose is going to do an interpreter swap. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. We're there now. Great. Thank you. Um, I've got a message um, uh, from Dion. As a person potentially losing sight progressively and a visual artist, I'd be keen to be able to select an audio describer in the much of the same way I choose to watch everything Ridley Scott creates. Do or could visually impaired blind people who choose to use AD select audio describers so um, for their style and artistry? Um, yes, I think so. I think, you know, if, if I think, uh, I mean, I don't do children's shows because I've got a scary voice and I've got, you know, and or I would sound like their grandmother. So, you know, I don't go, I don't do this kind of show, you know, I don't do, you know, Peppa Pig, um, because I don't think it would work very well. Uh, so there are certain things that, that you know, you've got, you've got to cast your audio describer. If I'm working perhaps with um, a literal visual artist, then uh, they will tell me what they want from the description. I will write the description around that. Uh, it'll be a collaborative thing. Um, when you just pick up uh, television, you get what you're given really. And if you go into the theatre and you don't like what the audio describer is doing, you can complain because you don't have to pay for something that is not working for you. And you need to be able to complain. And it shouldn't just up to be up to the visually impaired people, they should be asked as well, did that work for you? There should be a focus group. Is this working? Could we be offering more? Could we be offering different shows? Um, what is the tech like? How can we contact you? Would it help if we sent out uh, an audio describer or a, 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 a uh, um, constructive feedback? Yes, Dion say constructive feedback would be better. Yes, you're right. Yes, don't complain. Give constructive feedback. I'm sorry, I've heard some really lousy audio describers and I get very cross that they're inflicting themselves on, on people. Um, okay, right, thank you. I just want to um, talk a little bit about integrated audio description. Integrated audio description is something that has come about over the last five or six years, and it is very much led by disability group theatres um, and, and individuals who are putting their, themselves out there. And the idea of, inter of integrated theatre, integrated audio description, is that it runs alongside the show it is spoken by the cast and it means that you're accessible every night and you don't have to listen in through headsets. So that somebody will um, describe their movements. It wouldn't be as clunky as you might think. It would just be little visual cues that, that would be thrown in and it would be written to support the show with the same kind of artistic ideal as the, the show itself. It, it works well, and sometimes it doesn't work so well. It doesn't work so well if you don't have a blind consultant on board to be able to say, that's a bit that needs description. It doesn't work so well if you have somebody who um, says that they want integrated audio description and doesn't understand what it means and then worries that it spoils their show. So you have those things, you have all of those obstacles to climb over in order to get an integrated audio description. There are a lot of theatre groups that are doing it extremely well, and I will put a list of them um, uh, at the end. But one of the ones that, that was an early starter of this was um, Extant. And Extant um, is run by a blind woman. It has blind actors. It, is, uh, it has got the blind aesthetic throughout it. Uh, and they work with their actors and they um, do things like getting a, a tactile stage so people will know where they are on stage. They will use sound in order to give people cues. They will do all sorts of things that are done in collaboration with their blind actors. 
they did a thing called flight paths. Um, I'm just going to show you a little bit of flight paths, tiny little bit, about a minute or so. Two women are in on silks. They are acrobatics. Standing beside our silks, grabbing the silks with both hands. I've been offered something to eat. I'm going to tell to go away now. Thank you very much. Right. Still working. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, we've got oh dear, things I do for you. Um, so we've got in that case, we had um, that, that, that was Amelia Cavallo. And um, uh, you can see how the, the, the uh, description is actually integrated in with it. There are different ways. I think, Paul, you did integrated description with yours, didn't you? Well, kind of. The, the show sort of almost is audio described, but we did also have, so I worked with Stuart, who you taught, um, and he, we more did sort of creative audio description over the top um, of my audio description of the imaginary show. Um, so it was, it was a show that was already sort of audio described, but the bits that uh, the physical things that maybe I was doing needed audio description and that's where Stuart's voice came into the headphones and yeah we did it we tried to do it in a really creative way and the feedback we got from audiences was it was really successful um, because Stuart was not just there to say he's doing this he's raising his arm he he had a personality and a uh a sarcasm to him and a, he would say things what even when he didn't need to say things that were in some way dismissive of paul on stage in a comical way um so he became another character in your ear and and they felt like they uh, got an even richer experience than other people in the audience because they had their own private laughs which they could have to themselves um, and they found that they really enjoyed that and i saw paul's show several times and uh listened to the audio description on one occasion and it was brilliant it, it totally did give a different dimension to it and i i actually felt everybody should be listening to that as well because <laughs> it was great <laughs> that's often what we hear um was it was it uh wendy hoos did talk, talking birds did wendy hoos and they, no, not wasn't, it was uh, Birds of a Feather did Wendy Hoops, I think. And they had, uh, they had two, uh, a couple who were getting together and they did it, this is creative, we're moving on to creative really. Um, they created a character who was very, very sarky and would stand there and look at them and give them um, advice on their sexual techniques. 
uh, and, and that kind of thing. So it wasn't something that the rest of the audience would hear necessarily. It was an Easter egg for the visually impaired people. And it was a totally different kind of show. It wasn't an audio described show. It was a show that was built around audio description. And I think that's the difference. And that's if you can free yourself up to do that and not think in terms of, um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing an audio described show, you think in terms of saying, okay, how can I make this accessible? Perhaps by bringing in an, an extra character uh, and writing a script for them. I did um, uh, the audio description with um, a friend who's a burlesque artist and she wanted to bring audio description into her performance. She didn't quite know how to do it. And she decided, we, we decided between us that we would have uh, an ex-boyfriend so her actual audio describer hasn't turned up. So she's turned her to her ex-boyfriend to do the description. And he was over-describing horribly. He was, every single thing that, that she was doing, he was over-describing to the extent that it was, it was almost a sort of um, um, a mechanical kind of description. And then he tried to be sexy and he was, it was just a, an epic fail the whole way through. And, and you know, we, she was very playful with it. And there was a recording, it ended up with the recording of this, this boy, this young man uh, and, and um, his description, and that was added to it. And the idea that a, you know, a burlesque performer is thinking about audio description is, is great. It's, and she, you know, she's a friend, but she thought of it completely off her own bat. She said, right, let's, let's see what we can do with it. So there's, there's different ways of, of doing this. You can integrate it. People integrate it in different ways. Um, there have been people who have, for example, put um, a uh, telephone box on stage and the audio describer will go into the telephone box. Every time somebody goes into the telephone box, you get the audio description and it's different people, different characters. That's fine, except that the audience, the blind audience, is actually not getting too much of a different experience. They're still getting quite traditional audio description, um, but they're getting it through a telephone box and they've still got headphones on. And it was very interesting for the sighted members of the audience, but I don't know that they, it added a great deal of value in that particular case to the visually impaired people. The, what, what Paul described as actually having somebody who is disruptive um, is very much more something that would um, create a show that was specifically for people. And I think that's something that perhaps we can start aiming for, I really do. Because I think we've got um, many, many, many things at our disposal, but what we, we, we have got to get past the artistic directors thinking this is fun. This is something, it's another toy in my toolbox and not actually consulting with visually impaired people and spending time with visually impaired people to see what kind of effect it has on them when they bring them into the rehearsal room so that that person can say, hang on a sec, lost it there. Anything we can do about that? Get in a little bit of extra time, get in more description, get in different words, just you know, find out. But you, you have to have somebody in who listens to description regularly and relies on description. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they're a theatre creative. And I think there is quite a lot of this nepotism around, you know, you, you will talk to people in a circle and you won't actually think about the people who are sitting in the audience, they're paying money, they want the audio description, they want to have a good time, they want to be playful, but they need to be included and not left behind. And we need people to understand what integrated description is, what creative description is, perhaps with another character. I um, heard of one where they were doing Hamlet and they did the whole audio description as Laertes in blank verse. I don't know. <laughs> Can you write better than Shakespeare? I can't. Um, but, you know, it was, it was another way through. It was another way through. But I think we, we have to, we, we, People have to know what they're, what they're signing up for when they put their money down at the box office. They have to know that at the end of it, they're going to have an accessible show as well as an enjoyable show. Are there any questions on this? Yeah, I guess I have a question on that is, mm. uh, how, do you, um, how do you go about showing to people 
what the audio description is going to be like? Is that through trailers and things like that? Audio described trailers, yes. And pointing it to them. Pointing, you know, when, when, you, when you have it on, on your access page, actually it being on the access page and accessible. So the people have an idea of, of what it is. And some people will like creative description and some people won't. You're not going to get creative description into the West End. Andrew Lloyd Webber is never going to be able to use, never going to want us to use creative description. Actually, most big producers have no idea what I'm doing. I could be slaughtering chickens up there. They don't listen. They don't know. They don't know how we are interpreting their work. They don't actually get involved. So, you know, we're left in the sense to our own devices. Um, and that's why we need to have the input and the, uh, you know, the, the, the creative criticism from our audience as well. It's not enough for people to say, yeah, that was fine. Um, it's, it needs to be more than fine. It needs to be a good experience for them. I think you're, um, yeah, I, I, I think by using creative description, um, you, you forge a completely different way, but I, I still say that a lot of people will want the traditional because they will, they, they've, they've come for Les Mis. That's what they want. They've come for Les Mis. They've come for Cinderella. They've come for um, all sorts of different things that, you know, they've come for Pinta. They've not come for me to play around with Pinta. They've come for Pinta. I guess though that's one of the opportunities of being an independent artist making your own work is that- yes, it is. They, they're not to uh, see Paul. Sorry, could we just swap oh, yeah. interpreters? And um, Paul, could you just start that sentence again? Yeah, please? we'll do. Okay, ready when you are. Great. Yeah, I was just saying that feels like one of the opportunities of being an independent artist is that they're not coming to see Les Mis or Pinter. They're, if they are even coming to see Paul O'Donnell, <laughs> they're, they're coming to, to have a new experience at the theatre. And yeah. so if if every other audience member is doing that, a, a visually impaired audience member is also coming for something different and something original. So you can be a bit more original in how you present the audio descriptions alongside that, I guess. Yes, I think so. I think people who make their own work um, they, they, they can do what they like within the boundaries of, we need to know what's going on. I need to be included in, in the visual aspects of the play. And um, I, guess, I guess just to add on to that, that's what really worked about the process that I went through is that uh, you were talking a bit before about whether you're an interpreter or a co-creator. And in the process that I had with Stuart, we were really co-creators of the audio description and we were, he, I think it started by him going away and make, doing the, what the traditional audio description would be if it was just how everybody else will have done it. And then we worked together to find ways to like creatively break that and go, oh, actually, we've only got three seconds in the song, yeah. all of this across. So how are we going to do that in a fun way? And I was thinking earlier about there's a tap dance routine in in the show that I do and Stuart's audio description for that was just tappy tap tap tappy tap tap tappy tap <laughs> tap, 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 tap tap and it was like in time with the music and playing with the music and creating a sense of like the feeling of it but not not giving you any description because it it wasn't important really what I was tapping like <laughs> nobody else nobody else really knew what I was tapping um, yeah, with the dance, with the dance, you you let the tap, you just let the tap go. They want to hear the noise. They don't. Yeah, that's right. You don't want to. You know, if you've got if you've got a, a piece of a, a Matthew Vaughan, there's a story to be told. If you've got Indian dance, there's a story to be told. But when people are just moving around on stage making noises, let them do it. Just just do it. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so it, it is a question of knowing how to stay out of the way as well. But there have been people who've said to me, I went to see a production and I didn't know what happened at the end. And when I've spoken to people afterwards, they say, well, everybody knows how it, end, how it ends. Well, we had an example of that quite recently at the Globe, didn't we? When people, uh, there's, there's um, the, the uh, visual stories were put out and the Telegraph got hold of them and said, oh, everybody knows how Romeo and Juliet ends. And why have we got all these trigger warnings and things like that? Um, people don't, people don't. You know, not everybody comes from the same Western culture that we do and not everybody um, worships Shakespeare. 
or Lorca or anybody, you know, um, on the canon. Um, right, so um, I want to quickly go through the other thing that I think that everybody should be able to do. Sometimes you might not be able to get hold of an audio describer, give my love to Stuart Paul. Um, sometimes you may not be able to uh, get hold of an audio describer. Sometimes you may not feel confident about creating this for yourself. Um, so there is a, an actual bare minimum that you can offer that will help people to at least engage with your show. And for some people, it is enough. Two things, one of them is an audio introduction and the other one is a touch tool. The audio introduction is sent out in advance or made available on a website in advance. And it, it describes the set, the characters and the costumes. So, People have an idea when they come in what the set is like. They have an idea who these characters are. If I'm describing a streetcar named Desire, um, last one I did was in a cage. Um, I did Richard II in um, a shipping container. You know, there, there are, you know, Richard II is, is not always a medieval court. Sometimes it's in a shipping container. So you need to have an idea of the description of, of the set, the characters, the costumes, the lighting, maybe sound effects that are particularly important. That is recorded and it goes out on um, a website so that people can listen to it, download it if they want to. It also goes out as a Word document. It goes out as a Word document, not a PDF because they're not always compatible. It goes out as a Word document so that people can listen on their screen reader at the speed that they prefer. And uh, an introduction will typically last about 10 to 12 minutes. Some people will be able to read that on their screen reader in three. So you offer people choice. It's always a question of offering people choice. And the sort of things that you, you might want to include um, in is, is the, well, I wish, let, let's show you a picture. Let's show you a picture. Right, this was a show called Peter and Alice and um, Judy Dench, Ben Wishaw, yes. But it was a Peter and Alice were Peter Pan and Alice in Wonderland. And these were their actual, the people who it was actually um, based on, meeting sometime afterwards. So they're now grown and in Alice's case, an old woman. And they're meeting in a bookshop and it's, this is the storage room behind the bookshop. And when I'm teaching people to do audio description of sets, I want them to actually move the way around the set and find out exactly what is important and what isn't, because some things are going to be very, 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 very unimportant and just be there in set dressing. Other things are essential. The first thing I would do with something like this is it to empty it completely. I would take out all of the furniture, I would take out the people. And then I'm going to describe what the room is actually like. So this room is tall. It's got very cracked peeling cream plaster on it. It has four metal lampshades hanging from above and the light is coming through a glass paned roof, which is very mildewed and dirty, as is the top part of the room. It's all very grubby. It looks as if it has been very badly cared for. So that's an idea of an overview. So I want an overview of what the set is like. This is a, a set for a thing called Howie the Rookie and that was at the bush. And it's not a traditional thing because it has got um, a room, there's, there's, no, you know, there, no, there's no furniture in it, it is just light. And in that case, the light is the important thing. It was actually S. Devlin who, who, did, who developed this very early on in her career, and she's a person who uses light a lot. So it's just a platform that's on metal legs, 
Uh, I don't know how big it is. I wouldn't know how big it is from here, but I want to describe the size. And um, then I would describe the light sort of seeping through the center as if there's a slash in the center, neon light coming through. I would describe the lime green underneath it. And I would describe the colors of the walls on either side. And so you, the description is as we go in, as we find the place. And then if you have time during the show, then you can describe other things as they happen if there are big scene changes. In this case, this was a 10, 10 minute scene and then the whole thing opened up into a forest. So it was an entirely different thing. A lot of money there, but we want to know kind of what's where. So we need to know there's a central doorway. We need to know there's a clock above it. We need to know that there are bookshelves on either side with doors underneath. We need to know that there's a ladder leaning up against the left-hand bookcase and then there's a chair beside it. And we need to have a description of the books that are on it. And the books are in like, they're like encyclopedias, aren't they? They're very, stacked up, they're very, um, all the same color in a group. And in between them, you have parcels. And some of these parcels, brown paper parcels, cardboard boxes, they might look a little bit damp, a little bit mildewed. You've got a painting on the uh, top left-hand one, possibly a mezzo tint, but I don't know, I'd want to know. Um, again, very faded as if the damp's got to it. So we've got the idea, what does this place smell like? What, it, what would it like to actually be in this place? What would it feel like underfoot? And underfoot you have a checkered red and white floor and it's very grubby. So I get the feeling that if I walked on it, it would be gritty and it would make a sound. So we've, we incorporate all those sort of things into a description of a set. And then we think about the description of the characters and um, I want to just go through, I want to show you some of the characters that we've been looking at. This one, Judy Dench, Ben Wishaw. The, the assumption is when an actor is famous that everybody knows what they look like, they don't. So you have to describe Judy Dench, you have to describe what she's wearing, a height, a build. Ben Wishaw the same. How is he wearing his clothes? Uh, everything looks a bit baggy on him. It may be that he was um, a little bit more filled out when he bought those clothes, because they, if, he, if you put those sleeves down, they'll be a bit too long. He's wearing a brown jacket, gray trousers. Um, Charles has had these photographs in advance, so I hope he's had an opportunity to examine them. Um, it's really a description of how they're wearing their clothes, not just what they're wearing. They're not a dummy. They're not a, a, a dummy that you dress. This is um, a show called After Life, which was the opening show after um, the pandemic at the National Theatre. And we have five people in the picture. The um, premise is that they're in a liminal space between life and death, and that they help the people who have died to move on to the next stage. They're very different people. But recently, a little, a little bit too recently, I think, we've been talking about describing diversity. It's something that we've always done, we've had to do, but we've started to think about how we would describe diverse people. And there has been a study going on called Describing Diversity. And there is a training course that's about to start um, that will help with the describing of, of diversity. And one of the things that we've done is we have uh, been able to speak to the actors and ask how they would like to be described, how their character would like to be described. It always used to be, I think, that the default was that somebody was white. I think that, um, and, and somebody who wasn't white was mentioned. As somebody, as somebody who was outside the norm. And we're trying to switch that so that everybody 
is described on the level playing field. So that if somebody is white, we tell you that they're white. If somebody is black, we tell you that they're black. If somebody is East Asian, we tell you that they're East Asian. If somebody wants to uh, be described as mixed race, we tell you that they're mixed race. I mean, um, we don't know, we're not necessarily saying which race, um, unless they, because I don't necessarily know by looking at somebody what kind of race, they, what race they come from. Um, we, we need to you know, talk about people in terms of not African, but the area of Africa that they come from. I did a, shop called, a show called Barbershop Chronicles, and there was a lot of talk. It was, a, it was about barbershops all around the world and the African diaspora, and they were um, talking about how they can always recognize you know, a Somalian person, a Nigerian person, a Kenyan person. You know, I know that Somalians look like this. I know that Kenyans look like this. And we as white describers need to find that vocabulary. We need to find that language and we need to be able to do that work. And so we have been talking, everybody has been contributing to this discussion. We also need to think about describing disabled artists and how would they like to be described and how was their character. Um, if you've got somebody who is disabled, sometimes they will not want their, their disability described. Sometimes their disability is invisible. Um, I worked just before lockdown on a show where um, a chap did describe himself as disabled. Um, he was born with only one hand and he said, I don't want that mentioned. That is his decision. He doesn't want that mentioned. He was not cast as a disabled man. Simon Startin, who was one of the characters in this um, photograph that I showed you, um, he is a visually impaired man, but he also has other mobility disabilities. And he expressed those in his uh, work, in, in, in the, um, the character, he expressed those physical disabilities, but he did not express his visual impairment. So he decided he didn't want to mention that. You also have non-binary characters and you need to think about how they would like to be described. And again, we're oh, having a well, discussion. Yes. That's a perfect time for a little interpreter swap. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank I wonder, Roz, if um, I don't want to interrupt at all because this is all fascinating, useful stuff, but just if we could leave a little bit of time just for some questions at the end. Just I'm, yeah, I'm going to stop any second now, yeah. I mean, I just want to bring the, bring the fact in that this discussion is taking place. It is involving the people who are involved. Um, and there will be a course in September that if you're interested in, you can sign on to. I am stopped, Paul. Would you like to <laughs> open it up to discussion? Yeah, I mean, does anybody have any burning questions for Roz and or Charles um, at this point? This is Lisa speaking, Paul. Um, there's one in the chat from Colia that I've spotted. Um, Do you want to, could you read it out? Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, she's, so Colia said, uh, Dion, your question inspires me to think if it would be a solution to pair with an audio describer and grow together artistically. Oh, and then question for us, would such pairs of artists and audio describers be working well over time in terms of artistic growth and development? Would you personally opt for that or continue to provide audio descriptions for many different shows? I would try to do both um, because I have a rent to pay. And this is my job. So I would try to do both. Um, and I would certainly welcome the opportunity to, to work with somebody in a creative way, absolutely. And I think everybody that I know would welcome that opportunity to do that uh, and, and to work and, and find different ways through and develop. Um, I think it's, uh, I think as visual artists, that is very important, but I think I am not disabled. I have mobility problems, but I can't say I'm disabled. But I would certainly, yeah, I, I would certainly want disabled people to be at the heart of this. And most of the work that is going on creatively has disabled people at its heart. And I would really want that as well.
any other questions that anybody wants to raise? I was I was going to add to that that um, it's more like uh, the is is there is there already a school of audio describers and and if there is could the sort of curriculum be creatively developed to you know to have different flavors different artistry to the skill in the same way as curating or directing or you know camera or script writing there is um, a constant state of continued professional development as theatre has developed over the years we have found different challenges we might be working with multimedia um, we might be working with disabled artists. We might be, I mean, we don't just do name is as traditional describers. You know, we describe things like the Unlimited Festival. Um, we describe uh, the GDIF, the Greenwich and Docklands International Festival. Um, and we describe small venues. We describe solo artists and we describe, um, you know, huge you know, West End musicals. So, it's not a one size fits all for description. There is an audio description association and there is a, a company called Vocalize, a charity called Vocalize. And freelancers often belong to the audio description association and sometimes work for Vocalize, but they also do an awful lot of work themselves. And what they do is bring the, the work that they are doing with creatives and seed it into the audio description that the rest of us are doing. There's an awful lot of work that's being done in academia about description, but it's staying in academia. What we want is for it to translate to action and to practic practical work. And that's why when we learn something, when we talk to something, we talk to each other. Okay. From what you're saying, it sounds like there's some um, scope there for, you know, someone to write a PhD in practice based research. I think so, too. I think people have. I mean, Amelia Cavallo has. Um, uh, um, other people have. I mean, Louise, Louise Fryer has. There's an awful lot of people out there who have written from from a practice based session. Um, they they. It, it's just that it needs to be disseminated throughout. The problem, one of the problems is that in audio description is it started as volunteers and those volunteers have not been supported to grow. And some of them have remained there. And sometimes the only reason that they stop because they can't get up the stairs to the description box anymore. So there, there, there are people who have been, who've been working in kind of a silo and they haven't had the opportunity to discuss things learn things from each other. At the heart of what we do is consultation with visually impaired people. And I work with visually impaired trainers, I work with visually impaired um, mentors, I'd work with um, people, uh, if I work at the National, I have a visually impaired per person in for, for the shows to give me feedback and to tell me what's what. If I work for Vocalize, I am assessed by visually impaired people on a regular basis. So, you know, there is all this going on. And certainly when we're talking about continued professional development, there's work with um, uh, working over Zoom. I'm doing working over Zoom at the moment, which is a technical thing. Charles, I may speak to you about this. Um, we, uh, we work with um, contemporary dance. We work with opera. We work with animals. I work with circuses. If I work with circuses, I work in a very different way because uh, if I work with circus performers, anything can happen. People can fall. People, tricks do go wrong. Things happen. And with that, it means that I've got to stay absolutely in the moment. And I've got to be as excited as everybody else because I don't know what's going to happen next. So I don't do the sort of description that I did with bedroom fasts. It's much more catch your breath description. It's much more... <gasps> What's going to happen next description it's you know you've got to keep people in the moment of that particular artwork lisa you had your arm your hand up yeah thanks rose um i was just going to ask um based on what you were just saying and potentially for, for you charles about online working so if you are working with artists participants online um whether you had any sort of practical 
considerations or advice that so like earlier before um everybody else joined this zoom meeting today uh, you asked about the chat today and whether we'd be blocking it because um it somebody might be using a screen reader and in that case it's again just distracting over people speaking so it's a whole new world this <laughs> working yeah. online isn't it and i just wanted to yeah charles and um, do, do you have any sort of um advice there or things you'd like people to know <laughs> Um, yeah, it's. I think. I think similar to what I said maybe earlier that um, everyone's um, adaptions may be slightly different. For example, for myself, I do use a screen reader uh, sometimes. Maybe when my eyes get most tired, but predominantly I will use just magnification. Uh, so right now, I'm sure all of you guys can just see loads of tiles on Zoom where I'm zoomed in. Uh, don't worry, I'm not focusing on one particular person. I'm using my mouse and I'm scrolling around, making, you know, make, keeping keeping the conversation going, you know, looking at everyone. So that's my little adaption. And yeah, like the conversation we had before we went live was um, would my screen reader maybe be reading out comments as they popped up during mm. the session? Um, mm -hmm. Which, yeah, but yeah, it, it would do it. And that's, I, I would especially wouldn't want that to interrupt the session at all. So, um, that's why I said uh, to the group before we went live was that I won't be able to read the, the chat as it's going along. So do apologise in advance. Um, if there's anything else, you know, you need to ask me, ask me like this, you know. Um, and that's my little adaption where someone else may um, just simply put them, uh, you know, have to learn, they have to make sure they're muted uh, every time that they're just not speaking so that then that screen reader doesn't interrupt um, and as well, if other people's understanding is the most important thing, is that um, that adaption of a screen reader is so vital to that vision head or blind person to access the thing that they're trying to do. So it may be a slight inconvenience to you. I know, like Ros was talking about this with audio description in the theatres, and other uh, non-disabled um, theatre goers hearing it, and and and, and obviously having to sort of incorporate it in their experience. But if you, you just need to be a bit welcoming of it, to be honest, and that's, you know, slight difference to your experience because of a disabled person. I think that, you know, it's all a bit of give and take really. And talking of in the chat that we have a question from Isaac. I don't know if you want to ask it Isaac or you can point to me and I'll, yep. I can, I can ask it. Um, so it, I'll, I'll just read it out um, as that'll be clearer. Uh, assuming proper consultation with blind and visually impaired people could effective and sensitive narration led by a narrator character work in situations where venues and companies cannot afford the technology for audio headsets, kind of similar to integrated description. I was like, I think that's the whole thing. I do, I do think that that is one of the main things about creative description, it is what you want it to be, but it also frees you from this technology. Um, it frees you in, uh, to have somebody on stage. They could be just sitting on the stage commenting. Um, they could be within the action coming in every now and again. Um, I know that um, uh, Ramps on the Moon do this. They have a character who every now and again pops up and says something. And I think that's the whole thing with with integrated and with creative, you can get rid of that need for uh, description, for, for technology. Everybody hears the description. And if it's done well, nobody knows that they're hearing a description because it's not clunky. Nobody knows, they're just having more fun. They're just having more fun. Philip are in the, um, Philip had to go because her internet was playing up, but she passed on her thanks and also said she wanted to throw in that Claire Cunningham did some interesting creative AD in her piece, Guide Gods, yes. a show about religion and disability in which the audio description was the voice of God and heard by everyone. Um, so that's a, a nice example of what you're, you're saying there is, is that becomes something for everyone and is a, a fun element to the show in which God is talking to you to, to describe the show to you. We often talk about traditional audio description as the voice of God, because we, we you know, with this, this thing that you can't, you can't, 
get too involved. You've got to make sure that people actually understand and that, that this is a description voice. And then uh, it sometimes means that you talk like a speak your weight machine. So what we have is sympathetic, scene sympathetic description, where you will take on the vocal quality of the other people in the scene. So I'm not shouting at somebody when there's a love scene, that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, Claire Cunningham's a fantastic artist. She's a dancer um, and she is very, very creative with all sorts of um, access. And she's really worth checking out. Great. Sadly, we are coming to the end of our session. Um, we have one minute left. Um, just to say a really big thank you both to Roz and Charles. Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Roz. <laughs> I feel like we could have another another four hour session with you at some point and, and, uh, and pick both of your wisdom even more. Um, huge thanks to Jenny and Amy for BSL interpreting today. Um, you've been wonderful. Thank you. Okay, yours. Um, thanks to Lisa for being our tech guru. And thank you all very much for attending. I'm going to um, put into the chat a link for next week's session. Um, if you wish to sign up for that, as Philip has said, it will be led by Dan Thompson and Katie Walters <laughs> from Medical Body. Um, and they will be helping us to construct a manifesto for access that we can use. I'm also going to throw in um, a self plug, but to um, my accessing access pack, which impacts a little bit of some of the experiences I went through making my show more accessible to deaf and blind audiences. Um, so there's a lot in there about marketing and um, the practicalities of doing so, which may be useful to you. Um, other than that, I hope to see you next week. And thank you very much again for today. Lovely to see you. Thank you very much, Paul. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, Rose. Thank Thanks again. Thanks. Thank you.